Okay, and so we um, are going to start by talking about sentiment analysis based on single words. It's one of the two main approaches to sentiment analysis that you can take. Uh, later, Julia will talk to you about sentiment analysis based on entire sentences. And we'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of that. But we're gonna start with single words because it's a slightly easier um, way to get into it. And in this part, we're gonna be working with um, the Animal Crossing data. This is data that was posted by um, R for Data Science on their Tidy Tuesday account. So you can actually find it on their Tidy Tuesday. And um, we have it for you also here. And in case you don't know, Animal Crossing is a game that came out in 2020, like a few months ago, I think maybe in April. And it was really highly um, anticipated. It's kind of a sandboxy game. You have a little character that lives on an island with little animals and you collect resources and try and upgrade your island. And this is a game that has had really mixed reviews. Uh, people either think it's the best thing ever or it's super boring and all you're doing is running around the island collecting seashells. Uh, it's also been criticized because when you buy it uh, for, for Switch, for Nintendo Switch, which the platform it came out on, you could only have one island. So you can't, for example, you have an island and your boyfriend have an island or your brother or whatever. So people were quite upset about that. So we're gonna take a look at the reviews that were posted about this game and just kind of see what we um, can find out. I actually do need this back. So there's a couple of different um, data sets that are available on the GitHub for this data, but we're gonna look at the user reviews. And this data set um, includes a column for grade, which is a rating from zero, worst game ever, to 10, best game ever. And the username of the person who wrote it on whatever site this is posted on. You have the entire text as one uh, column. So yeah, everything that the person wrote to justify their grade. And you have the date that they posted it, which we're not really gonna use. And to get started looking at this text, what we're gonna do is um, pre-process it by putting it into tidy format. So in terms of text data, tidy format means we have one token per row. This is gonna make analysis easier slash possible. And a token can be any meaningful unit of text it's often a word, but you can set it to different uh, sizes. And in the tidy text package, there's this call called unnest tokens. This does a lot of useful things in one go. It splits up uh, sentences or paragraphs into single words. Or of course you can choose different token sizes like characters, engrams, which would be like three or four words, sentences, lines, you can use a regular expression, paragraphs, and there's even a special format for tweets. It removes punctuation, changes everything to lowercase. This is useful, it makes everything more comparable. And all you do for that is you feed it the data frame, the name of the new column you wanna give it, and the old column. So we're gonna call this uh, on our raw text. So we've just piped the raw text in as the first argument here. We have the new column we wanna be called word, and the old column was called text. And so you can see here, all of a sudden, we have just one word per row. So uh, for this first review, we have my girlfriend started playing before me. So everything is now, the data frame is now way longer, but it consists of just one word per line, and none of the other information is lost. It's repeated on every line, but it's not lost. So that's the, one of the main pre-processing steps you have to do. Now, another pre-processing step that you can do and sometimes useful for sentiment analysis, though not necessarily, is to remove stop words. And stop words. And this is something that the tidy text package can also handle uh, automatically. So it has a built in data frame called stop words. Yeah, you just cut out. Maybe you should quickly repeat just what a stop word is, basically. <laughs> yeah, a stop word is like a common but uh, meaningless function word like the, of, or to, basically anything that wouldn't really affect your analysis. You might want to leave these in for a sentiment analysis, but in certain cases you might want to take it out. So it's kind of a review uh, to show what stop words are. But tidy text has a data frame built in that includes stop words like a, about, above, 
in other words that don't have that much uh, meaning. Maybe more importantly, sentiment analysis is that you can make your own stop word list to take out words that uh, you don't want in there. I actually want to leave that one in for now. So for example, we might want to take out the words Nintendo Switch because you know, the word Switch, we know that that's the name of the console. It has nothing to do with the um, reviews. So we can just make this into a tibble. And we can remove this from our data frame using anti-join. So anti-join removes any words um, that are in both data frames. So if it's in our stop word list and it's in our real list, then it gets removed. And just to let you know, there's other um, stop words you can automatically get for other languages, like in the stop words package, you can get German. Okay, so I'm actually not going to remove all stop words here for this analysis, but I am going to uh, remove my own list, which is called more stop words. And if I run this, it's just going to remove those words, which you're not going to see. Okay, so that's that's pre-processing for sentiment analysis. The main thing is that you get it into single words per line with um, this unnest tokens, but then the Um, yeah, sorry, there's a, a quick question in the chat. Um, someone's asking, what again is a tibble? Right, so a tibble is, it's really similar to a data frame. Um, it's, yeah, it's similar to a data frame, but it's kind of the tidy verse version of a data frame. I think this would also work if it was a data frame, but I've used it as a tibble. One of the main differences is that tibbles don't treat characters uh, as factors. So it's not going to think that this is a factor with two levels being Nintendo and Switch. It's going to be um, consider them to be characters. But if you can see, if I open it up here, all I've done is made a really tiny data frame table that has two words in it. And that's, uh, that's all that that is. So I fed it in as a table and then you have to just define the name of the column and the, um, the contents of the column here as an array. Just keep in mind that the name of the column also has to be the same. Okay. Yeah, okay, so now we're all ready to start sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis by word, the basic idea of that is that uh, each, it looks up each word in a sort of in a dictionary, which already has defined if whether or not that word is positive or negative, or in other cases, uh, other emotions. And then we just take that information and we add up the scores for the text, textual unit. Now there's a couple of different dictionaries. They've been made by crowdsourcing, by the authors, a variety of different ways, usually more or less by hand. And you can use different ones uh, on their text, depending on kind of what you're trying to analyze. But you should keep in mind that because this is by word, the, uh, the sentiment analysis doesn't realize the larger context. So someone could be being sarcastic, but more importantly, someone could also say something like not good or hardly playable. And sentiment analysis isn't really going to catch that. It's just going to see good and say, oh, ding, ding, positive word, good. Okay, so that's that's definitely a disadvantage to um, word-based word sentiment analysis that you need to keep in mind. But anyway, so we have different dictionaries. You get them all with um, get understanding for sentiments, that's from the tidy text package as well. And then we're going to use an inner join. So an inner join keeps all words that are in both data frames. So this is why you don't really need to remove stop words, because if the word is not in the dictionary, it's not going to get a score. It's going to get dropped by this inner join. Okay, so inner join is just going to retain those words that the dictionary think have sentiment. And then we're just going to count or sum them up. So we're going to start with a dictionary called Bing. And this is a binary dictionary in that it only assigns words positive or negative. So if we look at, um, if we call get sentiments Bing, that will give us the data frame. And if we look at the first few lines, we can see kind of what sort of things it's looking for. So if it finds the word abnormal, it's going to score this as negative. Um, yeah, obviously it's a very long list with lots of words that start with A. So all we're going to do is inner join this sentiment dictionary to our data, which is already in a one word per line format. And any word that it finds in the review that it also finds in the dictionary, it's going to keep and it's going to tell us uh, whether it was negative or positive in the dictionary. 
So here we see they found sucks, that's a negative word, miss, a negative word, terrible, unacceptable, but great and gorgeous are positive words. Now it's not really helpful to us to just have every word and its sentiment, so we're going to want to count them up. If we just count the sentiments by adding this, this line, so you'll see in this code, I often repeat the whole chunk and I just add one line so you can kind of see how it builds up. But so if we just count the sentiment here, oops, then we can see that over all of these reviews, it finds 11,000 negative words and 12,800 positive words. Now this isn't super informative to us. We know that there's more information we could be using here. So let's first take a look at uh, the most common positive and negative words that it's picking up on. So the most positive or the most common positive word that it's counting in all of the reviews mushed together is uh, like, <laughs> that makes sense. Then it has fun, great, progress, good, enjoy. Um, there's also, it's finding negative words as well, but these are the top six <laughs> words that it's finding. So again, you have to keep in mind, always when you're doing sentiment analysis based on word that you don't have the full picture. So this could be saying no fun at all, no progress, you know. So we can see here if there's anything that sticks out. None of these really stick out to me. We could look through the whole list a little bit closer if we were doing a serious analysis, but just take a look and see if anything seems suspicious. It looks fine to me. So uh, I'm going to look at each user and what they got for their score. So for this, I'm going to count not only the sentiment, but also the username. And I'm going to retain grade just because I want that to show up. So if I were just to do username and sentiment, it's going to drop this grade column, which is maybe not what we want. Yeah, so here we have each, uh, each writer of a review. We know the grade that they gave the game. And we have on two lines now, um, one line for their negative, the amount of negative words they had, and one line for the number of positive words that they had. So this isn't super useful. So what we can do is we can use spread. Or again, we can also use um, pivot if you know, you're more comfortable with that, but I've just used spread here. And um, what this is going to do is put the positive and negative scores onto different columns. And then just for kind of us to look into it, I've also taken a total score where I've taken the negative words or the positive words minus the negative words to give us kind of an overall look at where this score is on the scale from positive to negative. So again, the spread is what's um, creating a negative and positive column. And this mutate is creating this total score column. So now we can look at each person's review, we can look at the grade they gave us, and we can see how many positive or negative words that they used. So yes, Ella is gone again. It's the positive words. Ah. I, we also lost the last, 30, like 10 seconds. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I was just showing that you can also look at the range of scores. <laughs> and one thing you might want to do is compare the sentiment scores to the grade that the user gave. And I've done that here. You can see the grade along the, the y axis here and the total score from negative to positive along the x axis. And while you can see that there's a slight trend here, there's it's not really strong, right? So this isn't, you wouldn't think given this violin plot that you could then take the sentiment score and guess what the reviewer gave the grade. So we're gonna look more into that later and try and figure out why that might be. But keeping that in mind, I wanna show you the next um, sentiment dictionary. This one is called AFIN and it is a scale from negative five, which is a very negative word to positive five, which is a very positive word. So you can see that it gives each uh, word a value. So if we join this same way, just with inner join, we again get a value for each, um, each word. And it drops out the words that doesn't have values for. 
And if we add to this a summary, then what we can do is we can um, actually group by the username. So again, we want to look at each person's individual review. We want to retain the grade. That's why I've left that in there. And we can actually just sum up the values. So previously we had to count because it was giving us categories, but with this sentiment dictionary, we just have to sum them up because it's actually giving us uh, numbers. And if we do that, we can see the score that, like the grade that each person gave and the score that the sentiment analysis is getting from their text. So you can see some, and some of these is doing a good job, like we have 10, a score of 10 for this person that gave a 10, but we have a score of 25 for this person who gave a two. So we definitely want to look into that more. But first of all, we should definitely um, just notice that this is on a much larger scale. So it's, we have someone who has 110 as a score and also someone who has a minus 33. So it's, it's, a, it's a bigger scale and it's more tilted towards positive. No. There is also another question. So someone mm -hmm. is asking, if you know how many reviews get dropped because the words are not in the dictionary. Uh, and she says that it appears to be quite a lot. Um, it'll, so it's gonna be a lot of words that are dropped. So here we're or like, it's probably not gonna be a lot of reviews that are dropped, I would assume, but there's probably a lot of words that are getting dropped. And that's partially because if you just drop stop words, that's also gonna drop a lot. You know, a lot of things will be, uh, the of if, but also basic words like was or there is, I don't, something like that. So you could actually take a look at that. You could take a look at the number of words that you start with. So you could do like an N row beforehand and then you could do an N row afterhand, afterwards and just see uh, what you get. But yeah, we're actually gonna have a, a time to stop and try all this in the middle in between um, when I'm done talking about this part. So maybe that'd be something interesting to look at and also to see if any entire reviews got dropped. For that, you could uh, sum up the unique number of usernames. Yeah, but you would expect a lot of words to get dropped. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we look at this uh, sentiment dictionary in the same style that we did the last one, you can see that it's also not a very strong trend. Um, and I've also put the code here for a slightly more professional looking graph with uh, box plots in it. Um, but you can see that there's like a slight trend, but not a whole lot. So let's take a look at what that is about. For this, we want to get the, the full text back in so that we can um, look at the full text. Reading it over lines is not going to be so effective. So I'm just going to join the, the raw data back onto the sentiments just as a rough um, way to look at that. And then I'm going to filter. So I want to filter for people who gave a score that was greater than eight, but have gotten a sentiment score that's below zero, which means that they have more negative words than positive. And I want to look at the text and the grade and the score and just see. So the, so someone who gave a 10 and got a total score of negative 17. Basically what's going on is that people um, liked the game and are annoyed with people who didn't like the game or who gave it zero points because of this limit of one island per switch. Um, so they're actually kind of making fun of or um, yeah, saying negative things about people who gave the game low, sco low scores because of that reason. Um, and that's why, um, yeah, and that's why they gave a high grade but the sentiment analysis is fairly negative or gives them a fairly negative um, score. And you can also see that there are some um, non-English uh, posts in there, which of course is the sentiment analysis is not going, going to work with those um, reliably or not at all really, because it's just yep. English words. Yeah, so those um, should be removed before you do an analysis. Um, yeah, and then we can do the same thing for the low scores that are getting, or the low grades that are getting high scores. And these are just generally going to be a little bit more optimistic reviews that people are saying, oh, yeah, I actually like this game, but, you know, no one can play it but me at my house, and that really sucks, and you're just trying to get more money and sell more consoles or whatever. So you can see that the sentiment analysis is actually relatively accurate. It's just that people, it describes more the way that people are writing rather than what, what score they're giving. Yeah. Okay, so um, one thing we can do is compare the two different 
uh, dictionaries. And here I'm working with a pretty large data set, so this is going to be pretty uninformative, but I just wanted to show you how you could do this if you had a, a slightly more suitable data set that was maybe not so big. But what you can do is make a column where you label what kind of method you were using for that sentiment analysis. And you can kind of bind together the, the result of both of the sentiment analysis, analyses, and then you'll be able to um, graph them. And you'll be able to see where the spikes kind of line up or don't line up. Um, for this, like I said, there's, there's a ton of data in here, so it's really not so informative, or maybe you could use a different visualization type. But maybe you want to play around with that in the time that we give um, for you to try some stuff. But anyway, you can see like a few have the same sort of trends, like this huge spike, but if others are less noticeable. Okay, so those were the first two sentiment dictionaries, and both of those have to do with only positive and negative words. So now I want to show you one that can deal with multiple emotions. And the only thing you should know about this is that uh, sometimes words are assigned to two or more emotions. Sometimes they're assigned to a lot of emotions. And also that these are, well, you can take a look and see what your impression is of the way that these are classified. But you can see here, uh, they have different emotions like positive, negative, anger, anticipation, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, and surprise. So for example, abacus they have as trust. So you should uh, take it with a grain of salt, but um, that's the way that it's set up. You can also see that the setup of this is similar to the first one we dealt with. So they're categorical groups. So we're going to need to use count, not sum it up like we did with the numbers. So let's do that. Let's join, do an inner join, and we'll count and see which words have which sentiment and what the, the most in this data set. OK, and right away we see something that's uh, strange, which is that they have player in a negative sense, which is maybe a, sort of a slang uh, meaning for player. And they also have console. So we know that this word is probably console, like as in a video game console. But there's also the verb to console someone, like if someone is really sad, you can console them. So they have this as both positive and sadness. And then they have, okay, fun, joy and positive, progress, anticipate, anticipation, joy, positive. But this is where we might want to return to our stop words. So I'm going to quickly make a tibble which has the words player and console in it. And then I'm going to take these words out of our, out of our data set before I then uh, count the number of sentiments per um, yeah, that are left in the data set. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to show, which is that here, if, if I do it before the spread, you have um, one sentiment on each line. But if I use spread, then it's just going to put this into separate columns for me so that one, um, one reviewer is on one line. So now we can see the grade that the person gave and how many words of each type were used in that review. And what we can do is we can actually graph this by grade. So we can look at the people who gave a score of 10 and see what the, what the distribution of scores were for them versus someone who gave a zero. And for that, we're just going to take the same code that we had above and then just um, fit it to a, a column bar graph and fill it with the color of the sentiment. So here you can see First of all, you can see that there's a lot of zero scores going on in this game, but there's also quite a few of tens. So people, which is pretty typical of review data that people either, either love it or hate it, or they don't write a review, right? So if you just think, oh, this is a mediocre game, you're probably not gonna write a review and you're probably not gonna have that much emotion in your review. So this is a look at what we have. We still see that there's a lot of positive words across all. That might be something that you could look at is I think there's a different number of uh, words for each category in the dictionary. And that would definitely be something that you could look at more closely because uh, there's probably a lot more positive words in there than there are words that express anger, for example. So it could have to do with the data, it could have to do with the dictionary. And one last thing I want to look at here is actually uh, to normalize over the amount of total um, the amount of total reviews. So as we can see, there's more zeros and there's more tens, but most of all, there's more zeros. So if we just look at the, the number of um, sentiments that are taken, that are 
show it for every grade, we're going to have just across the board a lot of numbers, like higher numbers in the zero, just because there are a lot of reviews going on in the zero area. And so one thing that you could do that's kind of a quick and dirty way to, uh, to like normalize over this would actually be just to kind of average them out. So to make a total column where you count how many reviews showed up in that grade and then just divide all of them by the total. And if you do that, you can see we're actually getting out really similar numbers. So really, really, really similar numbers across all of these. So there's about 20% positive words, 7% sadness words. And this has to do with the fact that I have a lot of data here and probably a little bit too much. So just compressing over um, grade is probably too coarse grained of an analysis for sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis, when you have really large texts, is likely to converge towards zero or converge towards sameness, just because if you have a ton of words, the dictionary is just finding the words that it has, and at some point it's going to reflect the proportions that are in the dictionary. So this is why if you're doing sentiment analysis with a book or something, it's often recommended that you do it with a chapter or chapter by chapter or a certain amount of pages or a certain amount of reviews and or reviews by date so you could track how sentiments change. But if you just throw a huge amount of text in a sentiment analysis, you're often going to get out pretty similar things. So the final thing I want to show you before we go on to give you a little bit of time to um, take a look at the data yourself, and before then Yulia goes on to tell you a bit more about a different approach to sentiment analysis, are comparison clouds. And comparison clouds are like word clouds, but they are looking at the sentiments that are expressed and kind of they're comparing the different sentiments. Okay, so. Um, yeah, we're just doing the same code as we did above, and we're using um, a cast or a cast, which is from the reshape two package, which is basically just going to spread it and end it, but end up with it being a matrix, which is a different data frame type. So you can see it looks a lot like our spread data, but it's a matrix instead of a tibble and instead of a data frame. So we just use that. Um, we're kind of doing word by sentiment. And when we run the comparison cloud, this is going to show us the negative words in one color and the positive words in another color. So just kind of a fun way to look at the positive and negative words. It gets you kind of a fun visualization. And you can also do it by sentiment if you have multiple emotions. So if we use the NRC dictionary, we can use this and we're going to get it in different colors for the different emotions. So purple is disgust and orange is anticipation, green is anger and so on. So I'll let, I won't talk too much about it, I'll let you play around with it. But just to recap, recap what we've done, um, there are three options for sentiment dictionaries. There's bin, which was positive negative, AFIN, which was from negative five to positive five, and NRC, which has multiple emotions. You should keep in mind that it doesn't consider negation. You should keep in mind to remove words that are overly influential, like where we had consoles or that have different parts of speech, different uses. You should also keep in mind how big your, your text data is. Um, try to kind of equalize over different size samples slash not use too big of samples. I don't use too big. And so it's good for an overview. We saw it's relatively uh, reliable, but there's all different types of errors that can come up. So I think we showed you some of those, but always just look closely at your data, the summary table, plot, filter, do all that stuff just to, to try and get out some of these uh, problems. All right. So as we've seen, um, we've, we can do sentiment analysis based on single words where we just um, join our data set, the words in our texts, um, together with some dictionary. So we, we've seen three examples of this, but it's already come up that this completely ignores things like negations. So what if someone's saying that they're not happy? Um, there are also other words that might have or that can have an effect on the sentiment. So if someone's saying that they're really happy, that's stronger, stronger sentiment than just happy. Um, these are called amplifiers. They can also be called intensifiers. Um, there are also the opposite, so de-amplifier, something like barely, um, and there are adversative conjunctions which also weaken um, the sentiment. So for my part, I'll be using a different package, which is called Sentiment R. Um, so here's also the link to the documentation because it has a lot of functions and we, we can only have a really quick look um, today. So it um, 
calculates the sentiment by for an entire sentence, right? So before we've done it for each word or for all the words that the dictionary knows. And now we're going to do it for entire sentences. So this approach finds words that have um, a certain sentiment like happy, for example. And then it also looks if happy is preceded by something like not happy. So we can have a look at these negators. So here we have ain't um, in different um, spellings also. So it can really find that. Also can't, cannot, and so on, right? So these would be the negators. Um, which flip the sign of um, of the sentiment. So instead of being happy being a positive sentiment, it not happy would get a negative sentiment. Um, amplifier, something like absolutely, decidedly, certainly, uh, would strengthen the sentiment. And deamplifiers, barely, almost, hardly, um, and also adversative conjunctions, however, but um, these would also weaken. Um, the sentiment. So let's have a mini example. So I'm just making a tiny little um, data frame that's called examples that looks like this. So we just have two sentences. I was very happy and she was not happy. Okay, so just two sentences. And then the basic um, code for sentiment R is you um, have to run get sentences first. So the first step is just that it goes through your text and it tries to find the sentence boundaries. So where does one sentence stop and the next one begin? So it looks for full stops and exclamation marks and question marks and so on. And then the command is just called sentiment. So if we run this, that's what the output looks like. So we have um, element ID, sentence one, sentence two. Um, it also counts the words, how many words we have per sentence, and then it gives us a sentiment score. And you can see that for the first sentence, I was very happy. It gives us positive 0 0.6 something. Um, and for the second example, she was not happy. It gives us a negative score, um, minus 0 0.3 something, right? And if we compare this to the approach that we've taken before, so I'm just using the Bing dictionary, but it wouldn't really matter. The others wouldn't um, do any better. It just finds happy twice because we have two sentences. They each contain happy. And it just tells us this is positive in both cases. And it doesn't know that this is negated. OK, um, so let's apply this. Um, I have two examples, two um, types or two kinds of data. Um, the first example is um, Shakespeare. So some uh, Shakespeare plays. This is, um, yeah, I also wanted to have these two examples to show you two ways of getting data. So this first one is what if you have um, text files, so txt files um, on your computer somewhere and you want to read them in. Um, so there you can use the read text package and the command is also just called read text. And the way this works is that um, right now, because we have a markdown document here, um, it automatically sets your working directory right where your markdown file is saved. Um, and in this same folder, I have a subfolder that's called Shakespeare texts, right? So I'm telling the read text package, um, please read in all the files. So that's what this little asterisk means. Read in all the files in this subfolder, okay? Um, and then it reads them in um, and it gives a variable that's called doc ID. So that's just what the file name was. And it has a column that's, that contains the text. So with the second command, I'm just removing the, the TXT ending, right? And then, it looks like um, yeah. it looks like this. It takes a second to load. Um, so I have the doc ID, which is going to just be the title of the play. Now you can see it. Um, so I've removed the TXT ending. This is otherwise just the name of the file. And then it has the entire text of the entire play in um, this one um, row, basically, right? So one row is one entire play. That's why it also takes a little bit to load. We'll talk about this column later. We'll add that in later. OK, so if we want to get um, sentiment scores with the sentiment R package, there are different um, are two main commands that you should know. So there's one that's just sentiment, which we've used for our little um, 
test or example data frame. And there's also sentiment by. So sentiment by, that allows you to calculate average sentiment scores by entire texts, so by chapters or by plays or by books, right? Um, so that's what we're doing here. I'm not running this code because it takes a long time. Um, so this is a, a disadvantage of using this kind of sentiment analysis because it first needs to find the sentence boundaries and then it needs to calculate um, the sentiment scores for each sentence and it has to check all these lists. Is there a negation? Is there something else that it needs to take care of? Um, because of that, it can be really slow. So I'm not running this. I have examples later that you can also run that are a bit faster, but we have, I think, 13 plays and the entire text. So it takes a while. But the way it works is, so this is our original data frame. This is the new one. I'm just calling sentiment, I'm just adding the sentiments. Um, and then the first step is to uh, create a new column that has the sentences. So the text split up into sentences, right? Um, so that's just the get sentences command and the text is just in the text column. Um, and then we're using the sentiment by command. So the first argument here is the sentences and we want a sentiment score per doc ID, which is the play, right? So that just is the play. And you might have noticed that this looks a bit um, unusual. So this is not a typo. I didn't try to type um, the pipe um, symbol, but this is a slightly different pipe. So this is a, a pipe that you can use if this command here, um, usually or often the, all the tidyverse commands, they will have kind of a, the first argument will be the data frame, right? Um, that you want to use. Um, but this one doesn't do it like that. So that's why you have to use this um, pipe and that can just handle um, cases where the next command, so sentiment by, um, where it doesn't expect the data frame to be the first argument, right? So that's why we have to use this slightly different um, symbol. But then we end up with um, this data frame, right? So we have, the doc ID, the play, word count, we have the average sentiment, and then we have um, the standard deviation as well, right, for that, because there's an average value, so the standard deviation gives you a bit of an idea how good this average value is at describing the sentiment of the entire play. Um, and then we can plot this. So I'm starting, I have a couple of different options here, they all, try to do the same thing but they kind of build on each other so you can so you can kind of build on them if you want to so here this is just a very basic one i'll make this a bit bigger so you can see it better where we just have um, the plays on the x-axis and then we have the average sentiment on the y-axis and like that that's pretty uninformative so let's reorder this so that it goes from highest sentiment to lowest. So again, I'll make it bigger. Okay, so now it's at least ordered a little bit. That's a bit better. Um, but now, okay, and here I have some labels, great. But now I would also like to add in the information on what kind of a play it is, because we would, if the sentiment analysis works even a little bit, then the comedies should have higher values than the tragedies, right? So here's an if else statement. I've already run this, so you might have already seen it that it's in the code, right? So here, this type of play column is comedy or tragedy, and there are also two history plays in there. So if we plot this, um, okay. But if we plot this, you can see that, so now we have negative is on the left, right? So the blue ones, the tragedies, those do get lower sentiment scores um, and the comedies do get higher sentiment scores on average. And the two is three plays, so this one is more in the middle and this one is a bit more, seems a bit more tragic or maybe a bit more negative, okay? Um, and I've gone a bit fancy with this plot. Um, this is a lollipop um, plot because I'm a, a fan of these recently, but you can of course just have um, just geom point um, and then color code it. And that's really all you need to get an impression, right? So you don't have to really bother with all of this if you don't want to. 
Okay, so we can see that at least this is working, right? Um, so now we've done it by entire plays. Uh, we can, of course, also do it by sentences. So in that case, this is what I'm calling the data frame. And then again, I'm here piping in the raw data. I'm running the get sentences command, and then the command is just sentiment. So not sentiment by, because we don't want it to be grouped by anything. Um, but yeah, just sentiment. Okay, and then this is what it looks like, right? So now we're starting with the first place. So now we have one line um, per sentence and we have the sentiment here uh, in the last column. Okay. Um, and yeah, as Kyla mentioned earlier, this is probably a better idea to look at the sentences instead of looking at these big blocks of, of data. So again, we can plot this. Um, so let's see how sentiment develops over time in the plays. So right now this is for all the plays. So just sentence ID as the plays progress. This is probably not very informative um, because as we've seen, they vary a lot in terms of their sentiment score. Um, so maybe we should split it up by play. So that's what we'll do next here. So I'm just adding in this facet wrap um, command. So that means make um, different plots per doc ID, so per play. So that's what's happening here. So you can see the lines look really different for some of the plays. Some of them look really uh, squiggly and yeah, like there's a lot going on or a lot of changes are happening. And then you'll notice that the X axis is the same for all of them right now, but some plays are shorter. So Merchant of Venice seems to be a pretty short one. So we can add this scales equals free X argument, which means that the scale should be um, just as long as it needs to be, or the X axis should be just as long as it needs to be for the, uh, for the play. Right, so let's look at that. Okay, so that looks a bit better. So now you can see it cuts off at different points. So here, 2000 something, 3000, 1500 and so on. And now we can see it, it a bit better, maybe a bit more clearly. Um, the Y axis is still the same and I think that's also good to leave it so you can see which ones are more positive and more negative maybe overall. Okay. Um, and again, we can color code this, we can play around with that, make the plot a bit um, fancier, but I probably shouldn't spend too, too much time on these um, plotting things. Right, but you can see some of them have a really strong, um, strong curve and lots of development going on. Okay, so these are all my Shakespeare examples. And again, if you want to um, work with the sentiment R package, you'll, so you'll quickly realize that it might take quite a long time to run this. So also for the exercises later, you should be aware that this might take a while and that you should work with smaller amounts of data. Julia? Okay. Yeah. And um, there is a question. So Hannah is asking why is Midsummer Night's Dream so flat? I guess from the last mm -hmm. you showed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we look at this again. Yeah, so it looks a little bit, um, strange that some of them are really kind of squiggly lines and then some of them look very flat. So Midsummer Night's Dream looks quite flat. Um, Julius Caesar, um, also Othello also. So let's maybe have um, a look. So um, let's try and have a look at, so doc ID equals, Let's just have a look at Midsummer. Have a look at what's going on. So that's a very good point that you should always um, take a look at your data, especially if something looks a bit weird. And I would like to see just the text, I think. Yeah. Yes, that's what I did mean. That's a very informative uh, error message. Okay. Okay, and we can see right here that there seems to be a problem with the file, right? So here we have backslash n, which is usually supposed to be translated into a new line, kind of a line break. 
So we see that all over that this doesn't seem to have, either there's a problem in the file or there's a problem while we read it in, right? So I think that might be an explanation for why um, the sentiment scores seem to be um, zero because, because then it will not recognize. So here, for example, um, God, when it's directly followed by a semicolon backslash n, it will not recognize that as a separate word, I think. And it might also um, mess with the recognition of the sentences or the sentence breaks, right? So I think um, that's why uh, the sentiment scores are probably really low or probably mostly zero, and that's why it comes out as that. Yeah, so a lot of them are very, a lot of them are zero or very close to zero, yeah. So that's probably why. So that's a good comment um, that if something looks a bit strange, it's always a good idea to look at your raw data again and see if there's anything going on that might explain that. Any other questions or remarks? That looks like it for now. Okay, good. So then I'll move on to another example. Um, so some different data because I also wanted to show you that you can use um, the Gutenberg R package. So this allows you to access Project Gutenberg. Uh, so the Project Gutenberg is a collection of um, lots of books and plays and poems, and you can easily download data into R using this package. So um, you need what you need for that is the Gutenberg ID. So they each have this unique um, identifier. And if you don't know that, you can use this command. So search in the, the metadata for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. You'll see it comes up four times with four different IDs. Um, these are just four different editions. So we'll just pick, we'll just pick 11. Um, and this is the command to download it. This second part you don't always need. It, this is basically telling R where, so from which source exactly it should download it. Usually it works if you just have 11 in the brackets and that's fine. Um, and then if you do that, it looks like this. So you have um, a column with Gutenberg ID, which we can also later drop because we only have one book. So the idea is if you have several books, they have different Gutenberg IDs and then you can compare them and group them or something like that. But we only, we're only looking at this one book. And then you can see that um, it gives you, so this is the entire text and you can see that it's preserving um, the lines of the original book, right? So this is how the line breaks were in, in this edition right, in the specific edition, okay? So that's important for later on. So this is a very different format than um, that we had with the Shakespeare text, for example. Um, so for this, so we'll also look at sentiment per sentence, but what we'd really like to do is have the information on which um, chapter it came from. We would like to retain that information. So you can see in the text, it says um, chapter one and then the chapter title, right? So you can see it says chapter and then um, it uses Roman numerals. So what we can do is use a regular expression. Um, so this is basically a search operation, right? So this is telling R find um, anything that is chapter and then that is followed by, these are just Roman numerals, right? And ignore the case. And then, so this regex is found in our text, right? So just in the text column, um, and we use um, string detect and this command. So this is cumulative sum. So this is basically doing, um, this is basically a counter. So you can think of this cumulative sum command as a counter that starts at zero. Um, and then it goes through the text and every time it detects this regular expression, so every time it finds chapter followed by Roman numeral, it counts up one, right? So it starts at zero um, and then it counts up by one. So let me just show you what it looks like. Oh, I need to. So here we have chapter one. 
Um, and here we have the chapter variable, right? So it starts at zero, 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 zero. And then here it finds chapter one and then it jumps to one. And then it stays one because we're still in the first chapter until it finds chapter two and then it jumps to two. And we've just seen that, so chapter zero, that's just things like the title, the author, the edition, and a bunch of blank lines. So we're getting rid of that. And we're also removing the Gutenberg ID because we don't need that information, right? And I'm also converting this into a factor. Okay. And we've just seen that the, the, the way the Gutenberg R package reads in the text, it keeps the line structure, so it keeps the line breaks. Um, and that's a problem for our get sentences function because the get sentences function only looks in the same line, right? So if a sentence starts in one line and then goes on in the next line, um, the get sentences function won't notice that the sentence is still going on, right? So it'll always stay in the same line. Um, so that means we need to do one final step in preparation uh, before we can run the sentiment analysis. So here, what I would like to do, so where I would like to get to is have um, uh, one, um, so I would like to have the chapters preserved, of course, because I want that. And then I would like to have the entire text of the chapter, right? So that's what we're doing here. We're doing, calling this text complete. And then we're basically pasting the text. So what was in the text column, the separate lines, and we're collapsing it by spaces. So we're just adding um, spaces by the end of the line and then we're putting um, the next line with it, right? So if we look at this, it looks like that. It takes a second to load. So we have chapter zero and then text complete. And this is now all the, um, all the text, right? All right. And I think my filter didn't really work. So I'll just run it again quickly, okay. All right, so now we should have it um, starting at chapter one. There we go. So now we have chapter one and then the entire text of chapter one. All right, um, and now we can run the sentiment analysis. And this is um, really similar to how we ran the sentiment analysis for Shakespeare. So sentiment by um, sentences, this is nearly the same command, right? And we're doing it by chapter. Right. Instead of doing it by place or by doc ID, uh, we're just doing it by chapter. Right. And now, if we look at that, um, and again, plot that. So this is very similar to before, just G on point, um, and with the chapters on the x-axis. And we see. So at first glance, it really looks like this is jumping all over the place. It looks like the chapters have really different sentiments. Starts kind of on a high note, and then chapter 11 is kind of the low point and then it goes up again. Um, what we do also have those, so um, let me show you the data frame here. So for each chapter we have the average sentiment, which is what we've just plotted. We also have the standard deviation and we can tell R to please show us the standard deviation as well. So we're doing this with geom error bar. Right, so this command, which is just um, telling R that please add in an error bar, um, which goes from, so minimum sentiment minus SD, maximum um, average sentiment plus SD, standard deviation. So it's just adding these error bars and suddenly we can see, if we look at the standard deviation, it's quite a different picture, right? So there's lots within the chapters, there's lots going on that the mean doesn't capture. So let's do the sentiment analysis by sentence, right? So this is also exactly like before. So just get sentences and then pipe it into the sentiment um, call. And now we can plot it by a chapter. So what I'm doing here is, again, this facet wrap um, command, so by chapters. Um, yeah, so for each chapter, plot it separately with free, a free x-axis because the chapters, again, are different in length. And um, this is new, so I'm adding in just a red line at zero. So let me show you. 
Okay, so now we have it plotted for each of the chapters separately, right? Um, and the red line is showing us um, zero. So zero would kind of be neutral um, in terms of the sentiment score. So it's, it can kind of show us where it goes, where it dips below and where it goes higher, okay? Okay, and so you've seen that we can use um, just sentiment to get the sentiment by, by each sentence, right, for each sentence. And you've also seen that we can use sentiment by to get it um, aggregated for chapter or book or play or whatever your variable is. But you can, of course, also use um, so tidyverse commands like this. So if you have the sentiment scores by chapter, as we have here in this data frame, you can just group by chapter and then use a summarize command to get the mean and the standard deviation. And that gives you the same output, All right? So if we run that, that gives you the same output as sentiment by chapter would do. So that that's just a little tip maybe to save time. If you know you need, you need to look at it by sentence, but then also aggregate it later by chapter or whatever else, um, it probably makes more sense to just do it by sentence and then aggregate um, it later like this, right? Okay. And then there's one nice um, little feature. So um, sentiment R has the highlight command. So that um, lets you, so that lets you look, look at the text and it shows you sentences that it thinks are positive and sentences it thinks are more negative. So I'm just doing that for two chapters just so it doesn't get too much. And then this part of the call you already know, this is the same. And then I'm just adding in or I'm piping it into highlight. So if we run this, this will open um, in my browser. Hopefully you can still see it, probably a bit small. Can you still see it? Yeah, we can still see it. Okay, cool. So here's chapter one. It gives you the, the average score up here. So this is a slightly more positive chapter. And then it gives you kind of in color coding this, it thinks it's negative. This, it thinks it's more positive, right? So that's a nice um, exploratory tool to see maybe difficulties um, that sentiment R might run into. So problems it might have uh, where it misinterprets something or where it has trouble um, picking up on uh, a sentence ending. So where it has trouble figuring out that this, this is the end of a sentence or something like that. So this is a nice um, exploratory tool that you can kind of go through um, and see where it maybe struggles. Right, so we've seen with sentiment R that you can do this um, polarity, so positive, negative um, analysis per sentence or per play or per chapter or whatever else. And um, the sentiment R package actually has a bunch of um, functions. And I've given you the link somewhere earlier, or you can also just Google for it because we don't have time to look at everything. Mm, but just some examples of what it can do is it can find and count um, swear words, like profanity. Uh, it can replace emojis and internet slang or abbreviations um, with words. So that makes your um, sentiment analysis a bit better if you can um, have, instead of the a smiling emoji, you can just have smile and then it can pick up on the positive sentiment there. Or same with slang and abbreviations. Um, and you can even create your own sentiment dictionary with it. Um, that you can then run um, and it'll still do this um, whole thing with the negations and so on, right? So that's pretty nice. Um, and one more thing it can also do is um, give you these emotion ratings. So the same emotions and also the same, in the background, the same dictionary that we've talked about before, the NRC. And the command is just the same um, really, or the structure is the same. So instead of sentiment, we have emotion everything else is the same. So you still have to do this get sentences and, and then pipe it into emotion. And then it looks like this. So you have emotion type. So we've seen these anger, anticipation, disgust, and so on. And it counts anger and anger negated. So it counts them separately, um, the emotion and the negated form of the emotion. It also looks at, so if you have unhappy, it counts that as negated as well, which is really useful. And then it gives you a count of these emotions and it gives you the second one is basically a percentage, right? Um, so 
the command is just the same. And then instead of having the sentiment um, score, you have these emotions and then negated forms, right? So, and again, you can plot these in whatever way you like. Um, you probably want to filter them <laughs> before you do that. Otherwise you'll end up with 16 lines in one plot and that might be a bit much. So here, um, I'm just using this filter command um, and I just want to plot um, fear and sadness just because I thought it might be interesting to see if fear and sadness kind of go hand in hand and develop um, in parallel. And then I'm piping this into ggplot. So this is a really nice um, feature um, of, of tidyverse that you can do. So you can have a filter condition. So only those two emotion types and then only plot these. Right? So let me show you. And I'm again doing this by chapter. So this is similar to the plots we've seen before. Just right now I'm doing it by separately by emotion type. So fear, fear is red, sadness is blue. And you can see that they do often kind of move in similar ways. So especially here in the last um, chapter, you can see that they move really closely. But you can also see that basically this shaded um, error area is really big. So there's with, I would say with the emotions even more than with this polarity, positive negative analysis, um, there's a lot that um, it just can't um, grasp or there's a lot that you have to be kind of careful with, right? Okay, um, yeah, we also have a couple of ideas for you to practice. What I want to do first, though, is quickly talk about a little bit of a takeaway message, or maybe I should have titled this um, warning or something like that. Um, so it's really tempting with sentiment analysis, I think, to just run it and make a nice um, plot or make a nice word cloud and then say, oh, great, you know, I, I now know what the sentiment of this text is like. But um, this is an automated analysis. Um, so this this is just an automated um, thing that's happening um, and it can go wrong in several ways or can get confused by lots of things. So um, with sentiment analysis, as with any other automated analysis, if you have non-standard language, if it's, for example, very informal, spoken, um, also if it's historical, it can run into um, problems. So it's always a good idea to take a close look at your data like we did with the Animal Crossing reviews to see why do some um, why do some reviewers that give good grades write such negative um, reviews? What's going on there? So that's obviously something that you have to look at. Or also, like we saw with the Shakespeare data, that there seems to be some problem with reading it in or something that's going on here. Um, and one additional thing here is that we don't have time for. That's really its own topic. But there are some things that you can do to improve um, your sentiment analysis. So you can um, make sure that you clean the data in the sense of removing, as we've seen, um, console from, from the Animal Crossing data, for example, removing that. Um, and there are also ways of annotating the data, so adding information to it. So one thing that would be really helpful for sentiment analysis is um, what's called lemmatization. So that means you um, for each word, you try to find the word's base form. So um, let's say your sentiment dictionary um, knows that happy is a positive word, but maybe it doesn't know happier, maybe it doesn't know happiest, something like that. And then if it doesn't know this word, it'll just ignore it or give it a, a zero, basically. And, and if we do lemmatization, instead of happier and happiest, we'll also get happy, right? So it'll um, find this base form. Um, and then that will improve um, yeah, the accuracy of our sentiment analysis. 